Hello and welcome. Today we are talking about distant starlight and we're talking specifically about a paper, a solution to the distant starlight problem. And when I saw that paper came out of Cedarville University, that immediately uh, caught my attention because the Christian school that I sent my my kids to, my two oldest K through 12 and my youngest uh, to, until we moved to Alabama, the vast majority of the students at that school go to Cedarville University. Cedarville University is also one of the few universities on Ken Ham's approved list because they teach exclusively young earth creationism in their science department. And so I thought, oh, this is going to be an easy debunk. And then I started reading the paper and I couldn't understand it. So then I looked at who the authors of the paper are and they are not students and they are actually not from Cedar Uphill University. Rather, they used the Cedar University uh, platform to publish their paper. So I asked Matt, almost a doctor, who is a physicist and uh, has some extensive knowledge in cosmology, at least more than I do, to come and help me out with this. Welcome, Matt. Oh, great to be here. Thanks for inviting me on. Now, yes, I did actually read this paper and I can understand why someone who doesn't have a physics background would find it hard to get through. And I also found it hard to get through, but probably for slightly different reasons to what yo know, they were hoping but i'm happy to get to that but yes this was um to say it was an interesting read would be leaving a lot of very descriptive words out <laughs> so before we get started uh let the viewers know what your credentials are okay so i have a background in both physics and chemistry so i have majors in both so that's the undergrad side i did my honors which is a very uniquely australian thing but basically like a master's in uh chemistry but it was actually in lasing so looking at light matter interactions and now i'm doing a phd in integrated um photonics so optics so i deal with a lot of light cosmology yes is now slightly if I was to say that slightly outside of my field, I would be talking a, a, in a strict sort of physics one, and I would be comparing myself to uh, basically people who study that and have studied it for, you know, decades. Not necessarily a bad thing because, yeah, you, you don't need to actually have a PhD in cosmology to understand why this paper has issues. <laughs> The the authors of the paper have no PhDs in cosmology either. When I looked it up, one was engineering, uh, one, one was computers. Um, the, the third one is the Dean of Engineering at Liberty University, which tells you a lot right there. If is, you that, know what is that um, Mr. Hovens? Falwell. Liberty oh, okay. University is yeah. Falwell's university. Okay. No, I was thinking, is that the one that he'd got his... PhD no, from, but... no. Liberty <laughs> University is kind of sort of a real, I mean, it is a real university. And uh, it, it's just that it's an ultra conservative. In fact, do you know um, Dr. Josh Bowen? Yes. He got okay. his undergrad at Liberty University. Oh, okay. Although talking about Hoven, Dr. Josh does do an amazing Ken Hoven. Okay. You have a review here. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Good evening, folks. Uh, Ken Hoven here. I understand uh, you guys are talking about me. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm here to I'm here to help. Okay. <clears throat> hey, you think that's do funny, any, do you? Are you talking do about any... uh, dinosaurs? <clears throat> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, let me let me tell you. You guys are probably some of those uh, evolutionists who uh, think that uh, you know a pine cone uh, created a dinosaur. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, of course, we know that dogs uh, never produce non-dogs. Okay, uh, so I'm here to help. Do you? Is that? <laughs> yes. Now, in my case, I I don't care too much about where you got your qualifications from, because if you actually know enough to publish a paper, well, you know enough. And that's guess like I've worked on quite a variety of projects across my degree, but it is one thing to talk about being an expert and then having a paper. But if none of the people are actually direct experts, that is a pretty damn big red flag. Mm, mm, now, okay. 
Yeah. And so I would say that, yeah, that if you were going to get your name on a paper and that's very different from authoring a paper, because in science, one of the things to understand, if we're going to start at the very top and have a look at who, who wrote the thing, apart from, as you've already mentioned, where it comes from, not everyone will contribute equally. And there are different conventions as to how you do those names. Now, if you're going to start and do it the way that most of the journals that I read do it, the first author is uh, normally the biggest contributor. So they did most of the writing or most of the research. Then it would sort of go in order. And then whoever is generally last or the last couple, particularly if it's more than one group or last few, will be the uh generally the supervisors they'll be the ones who maybe got the funding and who ran the project but probably didn't do any of the lab work they wouldn't have written the draft they almost certainly would have edited and all the papers i've been involved with i've been everywhere from first author to like the sixth one out of 20 you know 10 or 12 Mm -hmm. and if you're sitting towards the end then maybe you haven't had as much of a impact so that's actually at one way that you could probably get your name on papers that are not your direct area, but still have mm. made a decent contribution. I've done that by making basically control chemicals for papers. I, I've mm-hmm. also done it by helping out with certain optical parts of an experiment. And I could, I'm potentially going to get my name on others, but I'm not going to bring them up because that hasn't happened. Uh, but I've, I've drafted a paper this year and I'm working on a second one now, and they're both from my PhD. So I will mm. be first author so when i if i want to look at this one i would go to the first author and yeah this guy i couldn't find a lot on him Uh, i found something very interesting about him but ah, you go ahead and tell you what you found well he see like if you look at his publications he seems Mm -hmm. to have published a few things that are at least related to relativity but mm-hmm. then again, it could be in journals like this. Unfortunately, I didn't have the time to go looking too deep into them, nor does it really matter, as I said, because maybe they did actually write something worthwhile. That's not. What I made. found that was interesting about him, he is on the board of directors for Answers in Genesis. Big red flag. Yeah. That, but that then again, this is all right there. <laughs> yes. Now, I, I the other two, though, um, John Baumgartner, uh, I've mm-hmm. heard his name lots of times when listening to, normally out of interest, but listening to a lot of the the sort of debunk channels that, that go after young earth creationism, yours, yes. others, etc. particularly the ones that get into the actual people or the, the papers. He's a geophysicist. Oh, really? What the hell he's talking about cosmology for? I haven't got the foggiest idea other than I think they're just trying to take someone with a title and a bit of nuance. Now, here's what I found really interesting. If you look up some of his, um, the sort of, I guess, the bio descriptions you find on a few websites, they will state that he's also got his degree in space physics, which Mm -hmm. they never explain. And that might make you think, okay, that's yo know, astronomy, cosmology, and that's close to, well, this paper. It's not. It's about formation of plasma in the Earth's upper atmosphere. Um, the space physics doesn't actually have anything to do with cosmology. It's to do with the Earth and the local environment, and I believe he is quite related. So he's still a geophysicist. Yes, he actually has a PhD and seems to be good, but his Here's the other thing to remember. Just because you have a PhD doesn't make you an expert in science. It makes you an expert in one tiny, narrow, little niche field of science. And his seems to be computational. Mm. I have a lot of really good, close friends and colleagues who are computational physicists who I would not let them near any of my lab equipment. Mm-hmm. If that, you know, if even if, you know, my life depended on it, it's like, no, you can stay over there. I'm not going to touch your program because that's not my area. I'll deal with my lab stuff. You deal with that. Now, again, I am exaggerating a little bit. You'll, they'll probably have some expertise that allows them to handle some of my equipment. But they're not going to be doing research in an area that they have no background in. And by the time you become higher academics, you've probably got people in your group who are doing all sorts of things, both computational or not. But if you're writing a paper... Another red flag. So he's a computational geophysicist. Uh, what he's doing on cosmology paper, I haven't got a clue. And the 
last one um, is a mechanical engineer. Yeah. He's the Dean of Engineering at, at uh, Liberty University. Which, I mean, look, that's that's a pretty prestigious role, but mm -hmm. why the hell would you write this? Now, again, I normally wouldn't spend so much time looking at the authors, except when we actually get into the paper, you'll see why I bring this up. Because this paper, at least superficially, looks and reads like a scientific paper, but as we'll get into it, I'll hopefully identify a few problems that okay. will show up. Let's dig in. Let's. If okay. I'm looking for a paper, the first thing I'm going to look for is the title and mm -hmm. then after that the keywords because that'll tell me whether it's relevant to what I need to, to look up. So in my areas, if I see things like Quartz Enhanced Photoacoustic Spectroscopy or KeyPass, then I know I'm probably going to keep it. That's one area of my PhD. If I'm looking for, say, something on uh, the use of photonic lanterns in astronomy, which I know um, is a very niche one, but this that's the point, then I'm going to look for things like photonic lanterns. I'm going to look for that in the title, in the keywords. Once I've found a paper that I think is relevant, if I actually want to start taking information out of it, I'm going to go first to the abstract. I'm going to skim over it. I'm not going to read it too thoroughly. And then the next thing I do, and this one is a little strange, I'm going to look at the pretty pictures. And of okay. course, when I say pretty pictures, I don't mean someone's taken some nice photos of the lab. I mean the figures. But like we'll this. come back to, yes, I have definitely had a look at these. Now, <laughs> at first glance, it looks like it's something made in PowerPoint, which I want to point out is not a red flag. There okay. are a lot of genuine science publications maybe some with my name on them that have actually used clip art because it's not about what you use to make it. It's about whether it actually conveyed the information, but that's just, I just want to paint the audience. Yeah. So the abstract's a good one to start with. It's a good summary, but I also noticed a few things that they did that were against some conventions, different journals will have different conventions. So if I say it's normally done this way, that doesn't mean there aren't exceptions. Okay. Okay. And if that's just completely ridiculous to science, don't worry, I will hopefully mention that. We present a solution for the distant starlight problem that is consistent with scripture, special relativity, and observations of a young cosmos that is based on a special divine choice of initial conditions and a new synchrony convention. The initial conditions constrain the space-time coordinates of all stellar creation events to be just outside of the past light cone of Earth's day four, but within the past light cone of Earth's day five, while also being causally independent from one another. The synchrony convention interprets God's numbering of the creation days in Genesis 1 as describing a time coordinate for each location in the cosmos, a coordinate we call the creation time coordinate. And this is going to be crucial through the rest of the paper. So it's creation time coordinate. The CTC at a given star is defined as the elapsed time since that star was created plus three days. Two events are considered simultaneous, synchronous if and only if they have the same CTCs. We show that for these initial conditions and synchrony convention, starlight emitted on day four arrives at Earth also on day four. Is, is there anything that you particularly find interesting or, or noteworthy about that? Yes, I, I do find it odd that they already start referencing scripture and things. I have never read an actual science paper that does that. <laughs> However, if you were to write a science paper that was going to talk about things that you found, I'm sure maybe you could bring it up. That's not an immediate sort of dismissal. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to be dismissive of things in here, it has nothing to do with their religious convictions, but the fact yes, that what yes. they're talking about is complete pseudoscience. Mm -hmm. I want to to make a little note here, and yes, I know this is anecdotal, but the the other day, I actually, or the other week, I had a discussion with one of my uh, colleagues and friends in physics about religion. Now, neither mm. of us were experts in it, but the conversation was incredibly friendly. We didn't start calling each other names. I didn't call them delusional. They didn't say that I believe what I believe because I have some weird immoral convictions. It was just an interesting chat about what they believe, what I believe, why we do that, why I don't accept his. He walked away admitting that if I want to accept his claim, he has to give me serious reason to 
consider it. Mm -hmm. And I also walked away being like, this is exactly how this conversation should go. Mm -hmm. At no point did we have a serious disagreement about science. We are both scientists. We both Mm -hmm. physicists. We agree on that. It has nothing to do with the science. The only thing that matters is whether you do good science. So I, I just want to put that forward that if I'm attacking this paper, it's because the people in this paper are being pseudoscientific because that's what mm-hmm. I will attack. The okay. requirements to be a scientific model are uh, put forward by a, another young earth creationist uh, called Lyle. I, to the moment, forget his first name. I do have a couple of comments on, on his yeah, he, thing. He comes it, up in the very next sentence. Yes, he also um, comes up in the rest of the paper. They keep bringing his model up because essentially this one is building on that. And so if we look at the abstract, they essentially say that. They even reference him there. Though that is an unusual thing. You normally don't put references in your abstract because the ah. abstract's a summary of the paper. If I want the actual references, I'll read the paper. Mm, Again, okay. look, every journal has it's their own convention. Thing. If they want to do it... Uh, Yes, maybe stylistic, although it sort of more goes into content by that point. But yeah, it's not, doesn't dismiss it. It's just a little odd. Okay. Again, I could probably debunk most of the paper just by the abstract, but that (laughs) won't give enough context to why. And of course, at the end of the day, it's like, yes, so what? You need to prove it. Okay, our solution is a ref- reformulation of Lyle's solution, but ours spells out the required initial conditions without which Lyle's solution is ambiguous. It also replaces Lyle's use of the anisotropic synchrony convention, which is an observer specific subjective definition of simultaneity with the CTC synchrony convention, which is a divinely prescribed objective definition of simultaneity. Our solution predicts that stellar objects should appear youthful because the light we receive from them displays them at only a few thousand years after their creation. We show for our own galaxy the number of observed supernova remnants and observed supernova frequency support this prediction. Finally, we discuss the strong agreement among current creationist cosmologies regarding space-time coordinates of stellar creation events relative to the creation of the Earth itself. And now I have a whole lot more red flags going off. (laughs) Um, This is basically more red flags than the Soviet Army in World War II. Now... For one, they said other creationist scientists, I, they had to narrow that down because if they said scientists, well, they would be wrong. I mean, they're wrong a lot of times here, but they, they'd be even more wrong to a point where they can't really say that. It is not uncommon for science papers to have very, very technical, very difficult to read language like that. Mm-hmm. I, if you're starting off in an area and you're trying to read a paper, chances are at the beginning you most of them are going to read like that. They're going to be a lot of terms. It can take hours to get through a paper if it's in, you know, the first one in that field that you're reading, even mm-hmm. if you have a background. Like when I started my PhD, I, I didn't understand half or more of what was in some of the papers that now I read really quickly and need because that's how I'm going to run my next experiment. I want to know what they did and I want to copy it or take parts of it and improve it, which is, I guess, the whole point of the the method. For tiny bit more context, I'm in instrumentation, so I generally build things as well. Apart from that, they also do start bringing in some fancy terms here. The anisotropic synchrony convention, the ASC, that's going to come up a few times. That's basically Lyle's model. Anisotropic, just in this sense, just basically means things aren't the same going in different directions. I'll get to the specifics ah, of what okay. they mean. I do, uh, there's a couple of items. So. They do it with answers in Genesis too, but usually the answers in Genesis ones are not so technical that I can't do them. Now, yeah, and the synchrony, um, yeah, I'll have to get to that when we, we start talking about Lyle, but it sort of underpins where they're coming from with this paper. So I'm mm-hmm. thinking, why don't we why don't we get there? Because the paper will have most of it. I don't think we need to go through the whole paper. But there is one last thing I want to point out. They suddenly go in and talk about predictions about young stellar objects. Now, already they're wrong because we have stellar objects that we know are old, but that's 
a debate for another time. I'll only be just briefly dismissive of it here. But if you want, I'll go into more detail on another occasion. Now, they, yeah, the way they worded they, this, you know, stellar object, stellar objects should appear useful, youthful. Which, which they're I not. The and yeah, oh, sorry, sorry, I interrupted. I, I was just going to say, I got the impression they meant all stellar objects. The they all do. stars should appear youthful. Well, they do and they don't, oh, okay. but they can't have their cake and eat it too. And there is actually a section that randomly goes off on, on um, supernova remnants, SNRs. We will get to that, but it's a really weird thing for a paper to take such a turn. If it's not the focus of your paper at most you'll reference it and move on mm. you'll be and one thing yes this is a very common referencing convention to put the the name of the first author or the last the, their last name anyway because it's always referenced by last name and then the year physics and chem normally do the numbering system i prefer that it's easier to track the references and although at least here you can tell there's only a few authors that they're actually referencing they just tend to reference them over and over, over, and over again over. yeah all right so the introduction starts off um the distant starlight problem often raised against young age creation cosmology is as follows if creation occurred only a few thousand thousand years ago how can we see light from stars billions of light years away and then they go in to describe some of the models that have been put forward to answer this question and so far so good at least in terms of a structure thing when you when you have a paper i've already mentioned the abstract is going to be a summary the introduction is going to start off by giving context what's okay. the problem what's been done maybe a bit of history depending again on the paper and what you're doing if you're writing a review which for those who don't know, instead of being like a, a publication of new work is basically a summary, but it's going to take all the papers and say, this is what this part of the field is done to date. And the authors will be experts and they'll write it up. They, they often get cited a lot because they're essentially a summary. In this case, they're presenting a new model, again in quotes. And so starting off with the problem, saying this is what the problem is. This is what some people's attempts to do it. Then they go into this is why they don't work. So far from a structural point of view, that's what a normal science paper would do. And this is where I want to start pointing out that this is quite sinister. This paper on the surface reads like a proper science paper. But when you actually look at what they're saying and you do compare it to some of the subtleties to a, a more legitimate science paper, you start to see why it's such a misleading thing to do. This paper is written to sound scientific without actually having any scientific meat to it. There's no substance to this. However, that's something that we just have to explore as we unpack more of it. So to do that, I'm going to get to that whole ASC Lyle model, the anisotropic synchrony convention. And this is essentially the model that, and this is again where their intro starts, that Lyle put out that he pointed out that in science, in relativity, and I'm going to leave it at relativity, they point out special relativity, although this would also apply, I guess, to general relativity. If anyone wants to know the difference, uh, I general relativity, <laughs> <laughs> which is a fair enough distinction. Uh, rel uh, special relativity is non-accelerating reference frames and relativity is all about what does one reference frame see relative to another one. The, the one that Einstein used a lot was trains traveling at the speed of light or close to the speed of light. You can use spaceships. They actually do it later in this paper. You can use, you could use a boat flying across the moon. It wouldn't really matter it's about an observer moving and again that observer doesn't need to be a person just be some device be a clock on a plane they've done that they've done that with atomic clocks too to measure uh general and special relativity but the difference is is that with general relativity you bring acceleration into it and things start to get incredibly complicated to actually do the maths behind general relativity at least where i have studied you would not do that until at least four years into university physics. Mm, it's really okay. complicated. Special relativity, you can start doing the maths for that, at least in Australia, you can do that at high school. I did. Mm -hmm. I, I, Special relativity was also given as a option in second year for physics. And although I wasn't enrolled in that course, I had enough of my own. I still went to the lectures because they were really fascinating and the lecturer was awesome. But one thing that they get wrong in the intro is that they talk they only tag this with special relativity they keep mentioning special 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 and then one of the first things they mention out of that is gravitational time dilation as one of the 
things. I think they're just trying to say this model uses that. But yeah, that was a little interesting because gravitational fields are basically the same as acceleration and accelerating frames. So that would be general, but don't think it has a lot to do with it. But coming okay. back to that, what I was mentioning in relativity, one of the main conventions is that we will define time, uh, define light as traveling at the same speed in all directions. And that's really important because the underpinning conventions in relativity, although at least where all the maths comes from, is that light is constant. The speed of light is constant. Now, when Einstein came up with this, he actually referenced electromagnetism for it because you can actually derive the speed of light based on a few constants in electromagnetism. You actually, it's about wave equations and you can basically say, well, the velocity has to equal this and we know what these constants are. So the velocity is that. So it doesn't come out of nowhere, but that's where he defined it. We have since, I guess, proven most of his theories anyway, pretty well. But one thing that can't do is prove that light travels at the same speed in all directions because you need a reference. And unfortunately, if light is your reference, if it is not the same in all directions, you can't demonstrate it. The example that Lyle uses, and he's not wrong, this is a problem in physics, is that if you have two observers, the return journey the, the light takes is going to be... I, no, I'll rephrase that. If you want to check that the, the, the speed of light will be the same in both directions, well, you would think maybe it's quite simple. Let's put a clock at one end, clock at the other one. We'll synchronize the clocks. And this is, again, where the second word in this is coming from. And we'll send a pulse of light from one end to the other and we'll reflect it back. Okay. And we'll see what times those come in. Except those clocks have to be synchronized. So how mm -hmm. do you make sure that they're synchronized? Well, uh... if you keep the two clocks at the starting point, and then move mm -hmm. one out, well, no relativity has already affected you and you're now actually beholden to that fundamental fact that the speed of light is constant. And so the time dilation will mean that if it is not symmetric, well, by moving it out there, you've already offset that. And if you try and synchronize the, using a pulse of light, well, that's your reference frame. So in other words, the fact that relativity relies on that, I guess, convention that the speed of light is the same in all, you know, travels at the same velocity in all directions, you can't actually measure if it's different there's if you want a lot of detail there's a whole veritasium video on it and i'm sure a few others at, where they point out this is a big problem in physics because you're by the nature of it you are confined about it and there are there is some work to try and figure out if there is light uh, i guess asymmetry to it or the word that they use an isotropy um which is again the asc comes from so what he said what basically lyle did was he said well we're going to assume that light coming towards earth has happens instantly and the return journey is half the half of c the speed of light. Therefore, the return journey is the same because it go it comes to us instantly, but takes you know twice as long to go back. So therefore, the round journey is the same, and that works because it fits all of our. It solves all the problems for young Earth creationism in terms of the light problem, and and that is literally it. He he actually said this is just you know, this actually solves the problems and is consistent. And I know that they go on, they even have a section later in this, pa this paper talk, but, well, it's not just us trying to define the problem away. And I'm like, yes, yes, it is. But this is where it starts to get even more sinister. They, they actually try and depict science as also doing the same. They said that scientists, well, we just say that it's the same in all directions because the maths is easier and kind of true, but it's, and, and so he's saying it's a convention. It's like driving on the left or the right-hand side of the road. Therefore, I'm going to choose the convention that suits young earth creationism. And you're like, but that's not why science does it. Science, yes, it is easier to do in all directions, but I like to assume in all directions the maths, but it's not just scientists going, well, this works, so therefore we fold our hands, go to sleep, or sit down at our desk and pretend we're done. It's a serious problem because you can't actually demonstrate which one is the case. And so he literally says, well, if they do it by convention, therefore I can change the convention and do it whatever way I want. Solves the problem. <laughs> I actually watched a video. It's basically what he said. He uh -huh. said, well, I'm going to, def I, I'm basically going to make my convention where it's infinite coming towards us and half the speed of light going the other way. Because that's one thing you do know is that the return journey of the light has to be the same. Mm -hmm. It has to obey C. But that doesn't mean that the speed going in both directions just averaged across the whole thing, which is why you can say it goes instantaneously from one side. So when they're talking about this model, they're basically saying, even though these things are however many at times, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of light years away, the light comes to us instantly. But if you actually on those objects, you wouldn't see the earth. Where they get that from, I'm not going to be that colorful on your channel, but... <laughs> 
that's kind of that's the model that they're building okay. and again it's the way they depict scientists as just being like well it just works easier this way and i'm like no this isn't like it's like dark matter and dark energy just because there isn't a definitive answer it doesn't mean people aren't working on this it doesn't mean mm -hmm. it's not taken seriously a lot of work goes into actually trying to figure out if this is a problem and i believe that there may have been one study though i'm going off vague memories on this one that's a little outside my wheelhouse that maybe actually did detect a slight anisotropy to it, but it was only very slight. It wasn't infinite yes. in one direction and half speed in the other way. Because the other thing too is that means that everything coming towards Earth is infinite and going away. And that's weird because the Earth doesn't stay in one spot. It's in an orbit. Mm -hmm. So is the solar system in an orbit around the Milky Way. And the Milky Way is also moving. We're going to collide with the Andromeda galaxy but I believe we have quite a while for that. And even when we do collide, if there were still any humans around in our solar system, apart from some stars changing the night sky, we're not going to tell much because most of the activity will be at the galaxy center and also the galaxy, everything in it is so spread out because space is mainly empty that not really going to see much of a change from here. But from a if, galaxy point of view, you would. If light is traveling in, in you know, instantaneously toward Earth, but only yes. toward Earth, then the probe that is on Mars should not be able to detect stars. Uh, it still would. Okay. Because it's probably on the path, so the light still has to pass that probe to get to Earth. Okay. This is actually one thing that they're relying on a problem in physics, a legitimate problem where it is very hard to tell where the light travels the same in all directions. And then they're just going so far out that they've gone way off the edge of a cliff and they've crashed the car into some canyon that it's just, yeah, it's actually hard to describe other than they just pulled it out of somewhere that the sun doesn't shine. But it does rely on a legitimate problem in physics. But it's sort of, this is a problem in physics. They don't know. They use this convention so we can do whatever the hell we want to solve our problem. If you wanted to actually test that, not, not that it's possible, but if you wanted to, would you need to send something outside of the solar system to do that? Not necessarily. I, I okay. don't think you would need to. The, the difficulty is it doesn't matter where you send something. It's actually how you synchronize the clocks. That's the issue. Okay. And I, I know that Lyle actually does talk about then putting a radio tower in the middle and then having the two clocks so it actually goes out. But again, you have to synchronize the clocks. One of the, the examples that Veritasium uses is if you put an observer on Mars and try and assume this most extreme case of infinite one way half C in the other with that observer you would have no way of telling. Because again, to each observer, it would appear that the speed of light is the same in both directions. Because even if communication is instantaneous one way, then by the time the message gets back to them, it's still take and see. So the, the delay is the same. Because another thing in relativity is that you can't transmit information faster than C. Mm. Although I do think it would be interesting to see how that theory or this one compares to gravitational wave detection because those travel at sea, and those would also need to face the same anisotrope. But maybe they thought about fabric of space-time. However, they don't actually give a reason outside of it solves our problems and, well, the Bible said so. <laughs> but they actually don't. That's pretty that's pretty much par for the course for them. And the thing is, I said, I've got lots and lots of friends uh, in colleagues in science who are religious who would not pull this nonsense mm -hmm. they 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 might have their they'll all have their own interpretations but honestly they i'll let the young earth creationists debate with the re rest of the religious community as to which interpretation is best I, i'm not here to tell anyone how to interpret it i'm just here to point out when they want to try and play the science game because they mm -hmm. are trying to play a game this they're, they're relying oh, yeah. on a real problem we will see a layperson friendly version of this paper on an answers in genesis site in the near future it, it's yeah they basically just defined the problem away as much as they'll fight and they'll scream and they'll twist and they'll turn however that's more of lyle's one that's mm -hmm. what lyle did and this is building on that so we do actually need to keep going a bit because somehow there's more so mm -hmm. That's sort of where the intro gets to it. The intro goes on that talks about some of the other models as well. It talks about the you know, general relativity and there was so much time dilation that it just that the rest of the universe actually did have those billions of years compared to Earth because time on Earth went slow. But for 
the change, they actually get something scientifically correct and they say that there's not enough uh, gravity in the universe to actually account for that if you're talking about the Earth's reference frame and they're more or less correct on that. Relative, (laughs) yes, if you have a very, very strong gravitational field and you're close to that field, you will see the rest of the universe going fast forward because time relative to you will, well, relative to the rest of the universe for you will slow down. Okay, okay. So when Interstellar actually put people near a black hole and had everything else take longer when you're a bit further away, it's actually accurate. But they don't actually go into general relativity as cool as that is and as much as I'd love to talk about some of the the cooler aspects. You don't actually need to understand a lot about relativity to understand where they're trying to get from. I still don't fully understand this, all of it, but I know enough to know that it doesn't matter if I don't understand all of it. The bits that I do show that they, they haven't actually got anything to it. But anyway, I did also mentioned that i go to the the pretty pics so yes yes we better get to some of their there now yes so basically this diagram i've already pointed out was done in powerpoint but beyond that um figures in scientific papers should be standalone i shouldn't have to read the rest of the paper to understand what the figure is I may have to read the rest of the paper to understand what it means, particularly if I'm not an expert. But if I know the area, I should read the figure and understand what it means. Okay. In fact, when I read papers, if I have one that comes out in my area and they say they've done this, I normally first thing I'll go to now after I've scanned over the abstract to figure out, okay, what have they actually done? I'll, I'll go see the figures. And normally I'll be able to tell very quickly from those figures what they've done because that's where they're presenting the data. However, not one figure in this paper actually shows any data it's just models and yeah this well, is the only figure again, models i think there's no this is there's others but oh, okay. it's basically a repeat of this so mm-hmm. yeah or at least i did see some others and you will actually find diagrams like this in scientific papers this is a light cone so it's basically showing um light heading towards an observer the the little x plane i believe the cross between the x and the ct line there So the um, dot in the middle is the observer. And so anything on the far side of the cone is observing after that. And then the cone going into it is the is before. So it's about how light is observed going through different planes. This this is slightly outside of my wheelhouse, this bit of relativity. Mm -hmm. But again, (laughs) you don't need to fully understand all of it to know what they're talking about so what they've basically done so actually can we go to one of the later figures the one with the bit of color because it okay. it'll take that and it will show what they are attempting to do okay so basically the one on the left i believe they call it the einstein convention because again when einstein did his math he's assuming that the speed of light's the same in all directions so they're mm-hmm. basically like here's a diagram that shows that the one in the middle is lyle's convention the asc and then this is their one, the one that you were mentioning earlier, the CTC, the creation time coordinates. That the, okay. the use of a lot of acronyms in science. Coordinate. Quite, creation coordinate, time yeah. coordinate. Yeah. Um, they do talk about conventions, though, because I think the ASC is, is, is actually a convention. So, yeah, although the use of acronyms is uh, particularly in astronomy very, very heavy. And so I know a lot of... Uh, the academics around me who don't like it because they think it's over the top but it is easier than writing it out every time now one thing i do find odd about the way they write the figure captions not just for this one but the others is that they explain a hell of a lot of basics that you wouldn't normally do which is why another one of those red flags that points that this is meant this is written to sound scientific it's not actually written for science it's written basically for people to read and feel like they've read science Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the, the cases, this one, is when they have in brackets in the middle there, the prefix hyper refers to the fact that these are three-dimensional surfaces within four-dimensional space time instead of ordinary two-dimensional surfaces within three-dimensional space. And it's like, well, if you're an expert in that field, you wouldn't explain that. If you're actually presenting this to other you know, scientists in the field of relativity, you wouldn't write that. Mm. Not, not in a figure caption. You might best put it in the intro mm-hmm. or... In the actual text, you wouldn't do it in the figure because I said the figures are important, but you don't explain that. They will have a lot of detail. So having long figure captions like that is fine. And again, it's a little hard to understand everything they're doing. But what they pointed out with is that with Lyle's model, the ASC, is that if you have this weird asynchronous direction that's so much that people in different points, and I think this is actually what you're getting to when you mentioned, you know, what a probe on Mars would see, would still see. 
but they point out that you would think that everything occurred at different times, which is true. That's a legitimate problem with, with the model, because if it was that, if it was as extreme as they're pointing and as they're trying to point out, and it was always facing Earth, which uh -huh. again, remember Earth is, yeah, it'd be Earth relative to everything else and Earth's position is changing because i know they're not flat earthers although they're in the same category for a lot of what they do although they they don't like being compared to flat earthers and, but yet i think yeah the connection for some of them is quite fitting not all of them but i said these ones i would say it is but i said they legitimately point out that yeah different observers would see different time so what they do is they basically define it and be like we'll just we'll just put this plane and we'll just curve it so that it actually works and it doesn't matter where you are all the lights heading to earth problem solved mm. they, they they just define the problem away. I, I'm trying to think of a, a more detailed explanation, but I don't think there is one. They 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 do use some um uh, yeah, they use some technical language, but it just basically breaks down to the fact that instead of Lyle's more loosely defined like, oh, it just it's infinite coming towards Earth and half going away or something. I mean it has to have numbers, it doesn't work the other way. They've just said it still is, but we're actually going to define the observing surface so that everything actually spatially makes a bit more sense. I mean, it doesn't. They say that. And then they, they basically be like, problem solved. And it's just looking at going, so you basically just said, if we define the solution to not involve the problem, then it doesn't involve the problem. Now, light would travel in all directions simultaneously, would it not? It would travel, but what they're saying here and in Lyle's model is that it wouldn't travel at the same speed. Yeah, that's that's what I'm trying to understand. I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around that, okay, there's this star and the light traveling from that star is traveling at a particular speed in all directions except one. And in this one direction, it's traveling at an infinite rate. Is that what they're proposing? Not quite. Um. Actually, okay. let's go back to, and I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but let's go back to, I think it's figure two. So that one. This one. Yeah, that one. If you can, if you can zoom in a little bit. There we go. All right. So this figure here, I think is getting, trying to explain what they mean. Now, what I think they're saying is that everything in the universe, when it was created, the light traveled to earth instantly. So as soon mm -hmm. as the event happened, we saw it. And so what they're saying is that, in this one, they're actually talking about the observation of a supernova that occurred in, uh, well, that was at least observed in 1987. And then they have a go at, which is an atheistic assumption rooted in the belief that the cosmos was is not designed, is an actual quote from this paper, which is absolutely ridiculous because, as I said, there's you know, plenty of scientists who work on this who are religious. Nothing mm -hmm. to do with, with atheism, really. It has, it has to do with science and pseudoscience. But the supernova was observed in that year, and based on the distance, the observed distance between that uh, the star that exploded and Earth, it occurred about 170,000 years ago. But what they're saying is, no, the star was actually created with the rest of the universe on day four and then actually exploded um, 4,000 plus 1987, which is basically the universe started, was created at 4,000 BC and then it exploded in 1987. So therefore put the years together and that's how long ago it occurred. And then it just, the light just reached us instantly. And that's what this diagram is trying to show. There's all kinds of problems with that that are, have nothing to do with physics. I mean, what purpose would a god have for making a star that's going to instantly explode? Well, technically it didn't. It waited nearly 6,000 years to explode and then did. But this oh. also brings... Yeah, that's what they say. It, it actually exploded in 1987. They they take okay. their, a long ass time to explain. They take, and I don't know why they go out of their way to have this complicated diagram, which all they needed to say is no, it actually just happened in 1987, and we just saw it instantly we saw it in real time essentially but if you were on the star you wouldn't see the earth they actually state that they state that the light from earth would not have reached them they okay. and they'll get to their reasoning a bit later but what they and again they try and present this as some new and improved version of what lyle did but it's not really they, yeah. they've just added a bit more fluff to what was already a pretty silly idea and again mm -hmm. yes it is relying on a problem in physics and maybe maybe the speed of light is not the same in all directions but that's uh, although that's uh, you know i guess an assumption that a lot of physicists make in their calculations it's not one made without anyone understanding it 
It's not made at a convention because it's convenient. It's made because it's probably the best assumption. And if you can demonstrate that it's wrong and that we need to change it, then we will. But that's not how they depict the scientific community doing it. They depict it. They It's, it's a massive case of projection, actually, because they say, well, the scientific community does it by convention. Therefore, we can do whatever convention we want. As I mentioned, pretty much exactly what Lyle said. Therefore, this is not a problem. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm just sitting there going, but you're missing the point. That's you can't just define your problem away and pretend that this is a solution. Because mm-hmm. even if I grant so much of this, I still sit there going, okay, can you demonstrate it? Can you so prove? What have they changed from Lyle's model? What what do they feel like they have solved from Lyle's model? In their words, they have made more rigorous initial conditions mm-hmm. where they've basically set out and tried to map this CTC or coordinate system, this time coordinate system to say this is when they occurred. And it, they do it in this really verbose, way over the top language. Mm-hmm. And all they needed to say is that all it comes down to is everything was created on day, f- or like all the the, co- yeah, the stars, they keep using stars, but it's a lot more than just stars. It's everything that goes with them. It's the black holes and the, um, Neutron stars, including pulsars, magnets, at least a whole much to a whole bunch of stuff to it. But the rest of the cosmos was made on day four, and it was made pretty much as it is, and it's been nearly six thousand years, so that's what we see. Like that's it. Yeah, yeah. But they that, take this that... sweet time with it too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That led me to the question about the birth of stars, and we're we're now observing the oh, birth they don't of stars. Oh, I know they don't, but if if we can observe the birth of stars, would that not mean that those stars are being birthed simultaneously when we are seeing them? If yeah, they, and if... they do they do bring that up, and they say ah. it's they actually talk about simultaneity in this one as well, and they they as I said, it's an expansion of Lyle's thing. They. They say that they all occurred simultaneously when God made everything and then since there. And again, I, I don't like the religious side of it, but or at least because I'm not a theologian, but I, I do know the scientific side of it is, is just nonsense because yeah. they also then go in to talk about how this somehow ma- matches with a, a young universe. It doesn't because the things that we see, even if they're occurring in real time, we see things that are old. They talk about so one of the examples that they've already given is that supernova, the uh, the one from 1987 with the creative name that just has 1987 in the in the name of it, so you know when it was. And then they talk about the fact that we don't see more supernova re- remnants, but for a star to actually go supernova to actually explode, need a couple of things. One, it actually has to be a lot bigger than our sun. Our sun will not go supernova. It's too small. And two, even the biggest stars, because the bigger they are, the faster they burn the fuel, the earlier they'll go supernova. The To go supernova takes millions of years. Then the supernova mm. itself can actually take a long time. Now, there is a period right at the end, the bright part, where that supernova can basically outshine the center of the the galaxy so it can it on its own will produce so much light that it will outdo the brightest part of the milky way or whichever other galaxy they're in which is a lot of energy that's been released and unfortunately since the developer the development of the modern telescope we haven't actually had a supernova from this galaxy yet we've mm. only spotted ones in other galaxies but they're bright enough that you see them if you look mm-hmm. up a picture of one next to the galaxy they're bright and i i think unfortunately the last time one happened in this galaxy it was bright enough to light up the night sky, but it occurred before we had telescopes. Oh. Uh-huh. But only just. Mm-hmm. Six, 1600s? No, maybe early. But it was like it was in medieval times or late medieval times, I believe. I, I need to go look up the, the exact date. And then they go on this weird, weird tangent to talk about supernova and how long they take. And they actually point out that according to conventional science, it takes hundreds of thousands of years for some sections. And for the most part, they actually get it right. It's the only part that they actually get most of the science about the supernova and the SNRs, the supernova um, remnants. Um, Correct. And in fact, if you look on the right hand side there, you can actually see some of the maps uh, up the top and then going down the left. They actually go through and they talk about And they describe the basic process reasonably well. Again, they're giving this air of science. And the most amount of maths you'll see in this paper is from the supernova set. Um, Supernova remnants, if I get it correct, it could be wrong. It's Ah, on the right hand side. Yep. Um, So you can see they actually describe what it is. Again, a weird thing if you're 
doing this in an actual paper, though not too strange because this paper is on relativistic terms and this is a separate astronomical observation. So yes, maybe you would explain what it is because the people, the experts reading your paper may not actually be experts in this. So don't mm-hmm. fault them for But see, you can see that they put formula in there. You can see that mm-hmm. they have maths, they have numbers. They do go on to try and do some really hand wavy maths about how many we should see depending on how old the universe is and then be like, therefore it's young. <laughs> And I'm just thinking all they do is this is how many we should see. And then they pretend that if you see if it's so if a star goes supernova, obviously it, it basically the core of the star collapses and the um, and releases a hell of a lot of neutrinos. And although they don't interact with much, it re- the actual nuclear reactions release so much energy that it blasts the outer shell of the star away. And we're talking about a full-on supernova. You can still get other similar ones where a star will undergo essentially mini versions of this, where they'll blow off some of it, but the star won't stop. If we're talking about one of these, the core of the star will collapse. It will either become a neutron star of some description or become a black hole. And here's another point. And it's going to sound a little strange while I go on this tangent, but there is a reason that I bring this up. When scientists were modeling this, because, of course, when you run actual models, a lot of the time, if we want to know what happens in a star, you have to do this by computer modeling. Uh, Or before computers, you you do it by hand, although the term computer actually used to refer to a person. And so when um, astronomers started doing proper computer modeling for supernova a lot of the computer models fail in that the computer would run its simulation but just wouldn't make a supernova Mm. the whole thing like the actual physics in the or at least the modeled physics just wouldn't create that and for a long time they thought what are we getting wrong with our models until people went what if we're not what if the model is right what if sometimes the stars just fail to go supernova and they just collapse into like a black hole like these models suggest so they went looking at the night sky and if you And if you know how often that it occurs in this model, you know how many stars that we would need to look at of certain sizes, brightnesses, etc. Because you you have a good idea of how big a star is based on its brightness. Because again, it's it's directly related. I that's a not going to get into that detail here because otherwise, well, how many hours do we have? Uh, But. You can do it, and I haven't heard them also have any problems with this sort of math. It's just, it's fairly simple stuff. I, for some reason, the young Earth creations don't have an issue with it. Um, you can model how big these stars are. You know how many you need to observe before you're likely to spot any of them go supernova. You don't know which ones, but of course, if you know based on this, you know, how fast they'll burn fuel, how long their average lives are, if there's this many of them on average, it's like, nuclear decay i can't tell you when a particular atom is going to go and decay but if i have a whole block of radioactive material i can tell you pretty well what the half-life is and how how much radiation i'm going to get out it's the same thing they went looking and they saw exactly that they saw there was first time they did it they saw one star that just disappeared collapsed Mm -hmm. into a black hole and it was like okay so the computer modeling actually turned out to show us something we didn't already know was happening and then we observed it and showed it and that's how a lot of computer modeling is done it is compared to actual observations and mapped out they don't do any of that and then have a go at computer modeling so it's just modeling when they're complaining about all these supernova and again i don't understand why they go there other than it's some it's a young earth narrative and this is obviously something that demonstrates that the earth is and the universe is not that young i it's a weird tangent it's almost like the author's got a bit distracted part way through because they they're like well we'll well, all this indicates that the universe should be young. We've already seen and read quotes from them saying that. Therefore, here's an example of it. And then we're going to go into detail on, for some reason, the supernova remnants, but nothing else to that uh-huh. level. And then they show all these wonderful maths. And then as soon as the maths disagrees, they're like, yeah, but it's that they just dismiss it out. And yeah, it doesn't count because you can't actually observe a supernova in real time. Or, you know, these are just models. And it's like how this works. So like their own math works. doesn't agree with them? Oh, their own maths agrees with them. If you assume everything that they claim to assume without any evidence uh. for it. Okay, okay. But as soon as the maths disagrees with them, then it doesn't count because there's no uh, there's no observation of it. But then forget that they haven't actually demonstrated any observations for what they're showing. Okay, they actually claim to. I say that from a lay perspective because they have this section of observations that suggest the distant cosmos. Oh, I did want to go through this. Okay. This was fun. Okay. So um, I think we're going to have to go over this one fairly quickly. Because okay. again, how much time you, this is an odd section, as I said, you wouldn't 
if your paper was on this one model, you wouldn't have this weird sidetrack to talk about this. You would reference them. You would just reference them. Mm, okay. The whole point of the reference is that, so that someone who's interested can go look them up. Mm -hmm. This is almost like rewriting the intro again. There probably are some papers that do that, but this doesn't really have a lot to do with it. And so here they start off giving some generally okay science mm -hmm. and then proceed to basically pull a whole, whole lot of nonsense out of their ass to smear all over it. And it's just like, okay, all right, well, let's uh, let's have a look at the major heading. Just to see. CTC okay. solution versus conventional old age cosmologies. Is that what yes. we were talking about just a minute ago? Um, yes, and it's what they were talking about earlier, and now they're just, again, they've already defined their solution to Matt. So mm -hmm. here we go. Our solution is consistent with well-established scientific theories, such as the theory of special relativity. No, it's not. I mean, it could be if you define everything to match with it, but it doesn't actually really help because, again, there's no evidence for it. It invokes neither new physics nor miracles except the creation miracle itself. And I thought that line was absolutely hilarious the first time I read it because <laughs> it's like they're talking about how this all fits in with the creation, with that creation miracle. And then they said it doesn't invoke any miracles. And I'm like, but you just did. Mm -hmm. Um, I Actually, I actually understand why. Why they 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 have that line there, and that is because some apologists will say that being able to see starlight is in a is a miracle in addition to the miracle of creation. I think they may have actually referenced that in their intro. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I okay, that makes more sense. You're more versed with dealing with young Earth creationists. Yeah, I, I know am. the theology. I just don't know the <laughs> physics. <laughs> Oh, I understand enough physics to look at this and be like, okay, I could grant most of this and they still wouldn't have anything because at the end of the day, they don't present any evidence for it. To to go back a moment for all the, the modeling, you'll see that mm -hmm. the majority of their maths and numbers was in the so supernova set. Why the hell have they not presented any maths or modeling for their actual model? If you compare this to an actual science paper that tries to model things in cosmologies, it will be coated in the maths that goes with that model it'll go with simulations or with all with the actual work that goes into actually explaining what that model is and at least some mathematical basis for it even if you don't have a way to prove it they'll at least have some something behind it <coughs> They go into a point at this at this juncture um, that I was was somewhat interested in. That is that they bring up redshifting. There is no need to assume, as Setterfield proposed, that the speed of light varied in time. Although, if a slight change of the speed of light over time were discovered, it would not invalidate our solution. Rather, the ability to see distant stars in real time is a natural consequence of applying the principles of special relativity and God's own choice of initial conditions. Moreover, our proposed solution neither requires nor contradicts the modern theory of the expansion of which is based on the observation that distant starlight is redshifted. And that's where I became confused as to how does redshifting agree with, with their theory of light? Do, it can, doesn't. Can you, oh, okay. I, I was confused and then... I, I just it's sort of dawning on me that it just doesn't make sense they're, they're not linked and this is one of the dangers is that it sounds scientific but there's nothing to it see the the reason that we have red shifting is due to relativity but what actually goes on is that as light propagates the universe the actual space time itself is expanding so the the actual wavelength of the light gets expanded and redshift. That's one explanation. Another one is oh. too that because we're also moving away and we're ex at an accelerating rate, that's the important thing. As the light starts coming towards us, we're getting faster and faster away. So the light, so as soon as the first part of the wave hits, it's taking longer before the end. So it's basically stretching the wavelength out. It's redshifting. And if you want to know why they call it redshifting and blue shifting is because the visible part of the spectrum, the shorter wavelength end is the blue end and the longer wavelength end is the red end. So if they're getting longer, it's redshifting. If they're getting shorter, it's blue shifting. And when you look around us, we, we see redshifting. Everything's, is everything's ex expanding at an accelerating rate. Their like model that. does not explain that. They mm. pretend it does. Mm -hmm. They One of the things they go into, and I think they actually go into it later for some reason, is that they say that in the conventional models, uh, by that they mean the real science, um, 
it assumes that the there is nothing special about Earth, but in their model, you can assume there is spe something special about Earth because that's the way that God wanted it. And I'm like, I, 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 I have so many. I work alongside so many other people who would agree that Earth is special and mm -hmm. have nothing to do with this theory. Mm -hmm. it, it, mm -hmm. Being like, it's such a subjective term; it doesn't mean anything here. But what I think they're getting at is that somehow their model allows you to say that there is something special about Earth. In other words, they can define, they've got another reason, although it's not an actual reason, it's just them pulling stuff out of their ass, for saying that the light heading towards Earth is anisotropic, but always in the Earth direction, because that's the way God wanted it. He made the Earth special, so he made it so everything could reach us instantly and screw the rest of the universe. They don't quite yeah. use those words, but they essentially do. I'll see if we can find them a bit later. But their whole idea of redshift is like, it's just them saying the model fits with redshift. Well, until they actually demonstrate some mathematical basis for that, I'm going to tell them that they can put the model back where they probably got it from. <laughs> We we were answering questions about the year and my daughter asked the question, okay, what's something new you learned this year? And I said, I learned what redshift is. And I started to explain it and she was, wait, 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 is, is this child appropriate? <laughs> and I said, yes, <laughs> we're talking cosmology here. So I'm just, I, I just say that to let you know that redshift is not a term that has reached all of the general population. Uh, yes. So hopefully my explanation then then helped a bit. It's to so it is to do with the way that the wavelengths get stretched out, and so obviously if things are further away, and of course because the universe or the when I say universe, I talk about the local universe. If you want to talk about multiverse or other aspects of it, probably generally that would be cosmos. But our local universe is expanding at an accelerating rate. The further away you look, the further away they are, the faster away we should be accelerating things closer to us should be moving away from us at a, a, at a lower accelerating rate. And that's exactly what we see. That is essentially where the whole idea for the Big Bang comes from, is that we realized everything was expanding from a central point. Now, we've done a pretty decent job mapping out the universe. You can actually see maps where they figure out where we are compared to it, though it's really difficult to put them in sort of like a 2 or even 3D map. It's not that simple. And it's also why the universe can be a lot bigger um, than 14 billion light years. It's mm. the order of about 90 because it's it's like having a car on a aircraft carrier. Pick an mm -hmm. aircraft carrier because it's nice and long and other people have used it too. If the top speed of the car is 100 kilometers an hour, then the speed o speedometer on the car will never breach 100 kilometers an hour difficult but our brains did not evolve to understand relativity uh my my one of my favorite things is about actually being able to speed up and slow down time although that's again one thing this paper actually did do somewhat correct as they pointed out that that's a stupid way to explain a young earth or young cosmos is because the amount of gravity you would need to actually have earth going at only 6,000 years and the rest of the cosmos speeding up is not physically possible. Personally, I think it would be a lot more intellectually honest if they just said, miracle, it's all a miracle and move on. <laughs> because but there's also, because again, yes, there is the lighter, funnier side to it, but there is the more sinister side is that what they're doing is constantly painting this picture of scientists as being people who don't care for the rigors of science. And so it breeds this distrust for the scientific community. Mm -hmm. And that is really, really dangerous because you might think, okay, does it really matter if someone believes the universe is six to 10,000 years versus the, the actual close to 14 billion years that it is? Maybe on its own, possibly not. But if you buy into a lot of this and you constantly fed this these subtle messages in there, some that I hinted at it, such as the the modeling, the display, you know, that this doesn't make sense, or yeah, oh, they just modeled this or just just did that. It's like it slowly erodes away at the trust of conventional science. And so people will then more likely to be anti-vaxxers, which I mean, we, how yes. much of that have we seen with the pandemic? With the COVID? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yes, it was not always the Venn diagram was not completely overlapping, but there was a huge overlap. Mm -hmm. And you know, we also see it in other areas. It's not just science, but it's also this anti-professionalism, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. really, really dangerous. I mean, I, I could easily give a really good case of that, but I 
believe I would commit Godwin's law, so I probably won't. <laughs> now, explain no. what you mean about gravity. Where does gravity fall into this? It actually doesn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> I honestly don't know where they, they bring it up. So I, I've mentioned that some models would rely on that because I said if you have a really, really strong gravitational field, then anything closer to that uh, would see the rest of the universe in fast forward, even though in your own reference frame, time would, but in any reference frame, time will travel normally. You'll still do everything and you'll think that time's going at the same speed. But when you look outside at other reference frames, it'll look different. The way Einstein described it was observers on a train looking outside the window or looking at other objects in the train. The whole idea of relativity actually comes from a thought experiment where Einstein, where Einstein said that um, you, in a non-accelerating frame, you should not be able to tell that you're moving without reference to an outside point. There is no experiment you can do on the inside to tell that you're actually moving. So if I put you in deep space in a rocket ship and blacked out all the windows or made sure there were no windows, you can't see outside. If you're not accelerating, so the rock, like there's no, the engines aren't firing, you're just in some capsule essentially you can't tell whether you're stationary or whether you're moving reason i picked deep space is because it gets rid of air resistance and turbulence mm -hmm. and all that and the i mean although that is actually reference to an outside frame and technically turbulence is accelerating because you've been accelerated back and forward uh so einstein said what would happen if you were traveling at the speed of light and you held a mirror up in front of your face and he said if the speed of light was not a constant and you didn't modify everything else, then the, if you're traveling at the speed of light, the light should never reach the mirror. It should not get back to you. But that would break that rule. You'd be able to tell that you're moving without reference to an outside frame. So what he did is he said the speed of light is constant and everything else changes to accommodate it. And so what these guys have done is come along and say, yes, that's still the case, but the speed of light is not constant in all directions. Okay. And you can actually still do a lot of relativity with that assumption, but it is that. It's an assumption. There is no reason to adopt that. And as I've already pointed out, a lot of scientists accept that it's a problem that you can't really actually test whether there is some an isotropy to the speed of light, which is again, which is why I found this paper a bit weird in that they have a lot of this scientific terminology and then other things are explained very simply. It's pretending to be science and trying to cover what that would cover a lot of their model in a lot of really fancy terms without actually explaining their model. They don't. The reason why I haven't got a lot to to pick apart and debunk is there isn't anything there. There's no substance to this model. It's mm. just flowery, fancy words that yes come from a real science background but it's not but they don't actually mean anything if they can't present a more detailed more thorough model they pretend that they are but there's nothing to it they've used a few science terms and said if we assume that everything works for us then everything works <laughs> Um, I think that is a good job of covering the, the kinds of things I wanted to cover. But is there anything in the paper that we didn't cover yet that you think is worth addressing? Okay. Uh, have a look at their section where they, they go um, addressing potential problems. And then maybe if you wanted to, we could quickly go over the summary conclusion. I, I don't know if there's much to be gained there. Yeah. Addressing potential objections to the CTC solution. Yes. And so... Here, they actually go in and give a few potential solutions and some of the, oh, sorry, potential uh, objections. And some of them are proper objections. I'd say that they're enough to actually dismiss most of it, but obviously they don't. Um, <laughs> I like the first one. Does the ASC model simply define the problem away? I do actually want to read this one because I thought this one was interesting. They okay. basically says, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. And then walk away. Lyle writes, moreover, Moreover, we have seen that there are good reasons to su suppose that the Bible does indeed use ASC. Indeed, the problem disappears when we use ASC. Taken at its face value, the quoted paragraph suggests the distant starlight problem is resolved by simply switching the synchrony convention. I mean, it is. That's, it's, I, I didn't know. It's like looking at the sky and saying it's luminous purple. As pointed out earlier, however, it is the initial conditions that make the solution possible and not the convention. These two concepts, initial condi conditions and synchrony convention, are often conflated within Lyle's use of the term ASC, which has been a source of confusion but the ctc solution elucidates the distinction that's not a that that doesn't answer the damn question mm -hmm. they still define the problem away they just said that they didn't mm, okay <laughs> doesn't mean they didn't i 
I don't know if you if you got something out of that that I'm missing, but to me it just sounds like well because we define the initial conditions, therefore we haven't actually done that. Uh-huh. Although I kind of also got the vague impression that they were admitting that Lyle's problem does define the problem away, but therefore they've solved that problem by redefining the problem away. Yeah, I. <laughs> it was just sort of a good summary for the whole paper of this weird yeah, the, the obsession next... of using scientific terms without actually explaining it. Yeah, the next objection they address is that the convention is awkward. <laughs> I. So what? There's a lot of scientific conventions that are awkward, but it yeah, has to I be know. that's what you need. I don't. That's not an actual. That, and notice here that none of what I said was because it's awkward. Uh-huh. I, I just said that they define the problem away and haven't given any evidence for this. Um, the next one: Does the asymmetric light speed imply that space is anisotropic? Um, I mean, it has to be. What does anisotropic uh, def- mean? That's the anisotropic means it's not the same in order. Oh, okay. So that's, that's what they mean. That's their fancy term for the speed of light not going the same. So if the speed of light travels faster in one direction than the other, it means the universe is not the same in both directions. Okay. I think that's what they, um, because that's why they're saying, does it imply that space is there? It is important to recognize that the ASC is but one of an infinite number of equally valid conventions uh, concerning the one-way speed of light. Uh, None of these conventions affects the underlying nature of physical reality, and none of them implies that space is anisotropic. Choosing the ASC means choosing the one-way speed of light toward the observer to be infinite and the one-way light speed away of the observer to be C on 2. I've already explained what that means. It just means that the round trip is still C, but for some reason we can see, we can instantly see stuff that's however far away, infinitely far away, mm-hmm. uh, or as far away as light possible to travel. The CTC convention has a similar implication, except the observer is replaced with Earth, which I didn't realize this at the time, although I am reading this now, how stupid that is, because as I stated earlier in relativity, the observer does not need to be a person. So the Earth is technically an observer. It's Mm -hmm. a reference frame. So that sentence already shows the people writing, and well, shows him further, hopefully, but by now, the people writing this, either not writing for a scientific audience or don't understand what they're talking about. Mm. That is a huge, huge mistake to make. I, I don't know how I didn't pick that up earlier, but you would never say the observer is replaced with Earth because you can say an observer on Earth and it any scientist would know what you're talking about. Mm. Okay. Nice. Oh well. Does the asymmetry imply anisotropy properties in, of space? It is easier to it is easier to see the answer is no when one realizes that the one-way speed of light is a direct consequence of the synchrony convention and is not therefore an objective physical quantity. That doesn't that makes no sense because there would need to be a reason why the speed of light travels towards Earth much faster than the other way. And if it's a and so it would have to be something about the universe that makes it. So they basically not answered the question question that just mm. restated it said that our model fixes it restated the problem again and then walked away mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> how can light travel faster than c this question is related to the one above and has the same answer the one-way <laughs> speed of light is not a physical quantity on the other hand the round trip speed of light is a physical quantity and is always c regardless i said as i pointed out earlier this is a legitimate problem in science it could actually be anisotropic but there's no re- there's no reason to suggest it so being able to use this to say that this is a problem for starlight solution is literally we define the problem away okay good have you got evidence for it no if they can't if they can't demonstrate this i got nothing for them uh-huh. uh, come back to me when they actually have some evidence for this is a that's what I would probably say to them if they brought this up to me at a conference. Would you put this on par with someone who is suggesting Russell's teapot? You know, we can't disprove Russell's teapot. Um, therefore, it's possible. Is it, it, w- Would you say those are analogous? I guess in some senses, yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, analogies are never going to be perfect. True. Um the, the fact that there is some anisotropy, yes, would is probably there with Russell's teapot. At this point, we can't test. Mm-hmm. I don't believe so. It is possible that some groups are already working on it because I said I've got a vague memory of someone mentioning it, but it doesn't come to mind. If I if I can think of it, I'll send it to you. Again, you can add it in. Um, but as I'm aware, no one's actually demonstrated. And I think, as I said, for my memory of this vague one that of a group that did try and show it, 
it was if they if I think their conclusion was that if there was any, it was very very small. Mm-hmm. However, as I said, it's a huge problem because fundamentally you can't really demonstrate either way. So it's one of those things where it's where it's sort of okay. It doesn't really matter which way you assume. You still need to demonstrate it. And yes, we do by convention say that the speed of light is the same in all directions because that's easier to work with. But so far that assumptions held up. If you want to come in and say yes. It's, and have this really extreme version of it, then you have no evidence for it. Yes, maybe it's analogous, maybe it's a good thought experiment, but a thought experiment is not useful unless you actually can advance science, if you can actually get something. Okay. And I don't think they do. And at least with Russell's teapot, well, there are ways for testing for it. Mm-hmm. Even if we don't have the technology, I guess if you made a sensor that was sensitive enough, you could pick it up. We track all sorts of things in the in the universe. But yeah, if you, from a science fiction point of view, if you wanted to hide something, an alien spacecraft, just paint it black. You probably won't see it. Well, we won't see it. Next question. Are the CTCs physically realizable coordinates? I, yeah, because this is what they're saying is there's some weird time coordinates. Is they don't define it well. This is what I thought, this is why I'm having such a problem actually explaining what they mean, because I don't think they do either. They but they say right here, the CTCs are well-defined time coordinates. Well, then where's that definition? I've read the whole paper i don't see the definition they just say that we define like they they just define the problem away they don't actually explain what it is Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i could be missing something but then again maybe i'll believe them if i have a massive blow to the head i don't know it's just (laughs) well it says here the definition parallels the big bang models definition of the co-moving time coordinates also known as cosmological time which represents the elapsed time since the big bang our reference is the co-moving coordinates from the big bang model is not an endorsement of that model i love how they have to put that in (laughs) So that, like again, this is not actually written for a science. This is basically written for a lay person to make them think they've read science. Mm-hmm. This mm-hmm. is not science. I, I already point. I mean, I don't know how, if it's worth pointing out again that there is no substance to this paper. It's just a bunch of fancy sounding words and at best a very vague thought experiment that doesn't actually help. Okay, but it's but the structure of this paper, the way they've presented it, is similar to in at least many parts to a scientific paper. I can understand how someone who is not well versed in the science or is not familiar with this or has bought into a lot of the young earth, the more extreme rhetoric could read this and think they've come away with oh yeah they've solved it and that's what i don't like it sort of this erosion of how science is actually done i i find it fascinating their their final point of objection has nothing to do with the paper um humphrey's argument that scripture points to old cosmos uh, you know it, it's entirely a theological point and has nothing to do with with um yeah. Which is why I've done my best not to actually touch too much on the theology of it. Um, mm-hmm. I'm referring to the young earth creationists who put push this, not not the actual theology, because, well, I'm not a theologian. And two, as I pointed out, there's plenty of people who have interpretations that they match very well with science. My job is, at least my online persona or job, is not, not to remove people's faith or to take away their religion. I have no intention of doing that. As mm-hmm. I said, I... I am really happy that I can have those sorts of conversations with a lot of the people I work with, but they've been friendly. And at Mm -hmm. the end of the day, we've both got on with science and we've both done good science because that's what matters. But that is not what they're doing here. My problem here is that they're not doing good science. They say they've presented this model. They use some fancy terms. They give one or two figures that were done in PowerPoint. Where's the maths to show this coordinate system? Where do they actually map this out? It's non-existent. The whole thing is non-existent. It's this shell of fancy science words and then nothing inside it. Mm. In the words of Jesus, they are whitewashed tombs. <laughs> Thank you so much, Matt, for helping me with this. I, I think I now have a good grasp of what they are doing and why. And I so much appreciate your helping me as I could not read this on my own. Oh, I'm glad I could be of help. And hopefully I'll have the chance to do it again sometime. Yes, definitely. Live your life. Oh, so on. Be like a proton and stay positive. Cool. But that's my catchphrase. Okay.